Yeah, I thought to myself, my daughter's going to see this one day. And I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. I can't control her reaction to this. And I'm just going to have to tell her, honey, mommy needed to do it. Some things are just for me. Yes, you're in the shot. Yes, you're there. <laughs> I'm, I guess I brought you there unwillingly. But at that point in time, you were just with me. <laughs> and I was doing what I had to do. <laughs> Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Jess Weixler is an actor. She sat down with me in cyberspace to talk about the work. The very first actor I talked to on the show was, uh, was the great Kevin Corrigan mm-hmm. a couple years ago. And um, he likened the work of the actor to like building a house. And of course, when you build a house, the foundation is hugely important. Like you're building everything on top of the foundation if we're gonna keep this analogy going. And I keep asking every actor, what do you do first when you get a script to build this character? And, but I, 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 I want to know, is it really important what you do first? I love the analogy of a house. I think in order for me to, um, the way I approach it is, it's also the way I approach like, therapy, I suppose, is I feel like I am a house. It it helps me think of myself as a house sometimes. And I, there are rooms in my house that are not as lit as others, like Mm. parts of me that are a little dark, a little closed off where the foundation is wobbly. And I would say, when I read a script or a character, I'm first probably trying to find the rooms in my house that are lit up oh. by what oh, that's I'm reading, yes. by that per- by the journey that is happening for that character or for that story. Um, cause then I, I can go, okay, these are the parts of me that, that get it. Mm-hmm. The, these are the rooms in my house, which I feel like I can see things in the room. I know why that person wants and needs what they want in this way. But then from there on, I think the work is to doing the digging down to be like, okay, so where is the foundation now? If these are the main rooms of the house Mm -hmm. that this character lives in, be it, uh, I'm (laughs) it's getting so abstract. (laughs) Make sure that. No, and I think I know what you mean. I think what you mean is like, if that's the room that lit up, but how, how, where does that electricity come from? That's lighting that up way down. Yeah. And how to keep, basically keep it connected to my house the whole time. Cause I don't, I don't actually believe in character work in the sense of like trying to mimic anything or I, I think eventually you can mimic something, but I think that comes way later if it's, mm. if it's something that requires that. But I, I feel like every character and actor plays, I want to know that, it's actually a part of them that they've they've maybe taken a room in their house and their own person that they don't usually light up that much. Mm. And they've figured out how to turn the lights on in that room. Yes. So then- for me, I feel like I'm I'm when I'm looking at a script and I'm like, ooh, I kind of get it, but I need like I know that there are, that the house is bigger than that. And it's a matter of trying to find those little dark corners and go, okay, how, like, how would I fully relate to this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Me. And that kind of transforms mannerisms eventually, yes. maybe. Yes. Yes. Um, but they should come, I think they should come from 
it being really true to who you are, not like you pretending to be somebody else. So this is not just to uh, make the job easier because it's connected to you, but actually because it makes the work better if it's connected to you. I think so. I, I also think when I'm watching something, my, okay, I'm first I'm going to say my, my acting coach who I've like worked with for like, I don't know, 20 years now, I've got like my guy, he, he's always, he asks this like trick question to his students. Like when you watch something, do you want to get to, do you feel like you want to relate to the actor or the character? And everybody says, Oh, you want to see the character that they're playing. And he's like, no, you really, you want to get, you want that actor to have brought themselves to it That's interesting. so much that they become the character, that it's the way that person, mm-hmm. you would live in these circumstances, mm-hmm. these, these fake imaginary circumstances. Mm-hmm. Did a lot of this come about, I mean, you were talking about your, your, your great acting coach, but did some of this come about like in school? Like did, you, you went to Juilliard, right? I did go to Juilliard. I went, I mean, I was 17 when I started Juilliard. Mm. And in some ways I feel like I was too young and like all wrapped up in my own anxiety and mm-hmm. need for approval that I almost couldn't hear <laughs> what mm. was happening mm. until later. Maybe it started to sink in and mm-hmm. then I could apl- apply Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. gone through that experience. W- was it overwhelming in, in, in many ways that, that, cause I've, I've, I've heard that from actors, Juilliard in particular, over, a little overwhelming and not ready for it. I think, I think maybe just being for me, maybe it's, it's probably not true for everyone. For me being like a little bit more mature may have helped me to break myself down and be more willing to do it in a way that wasn't so, embarrassed um Mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how to be cool and make friends you know all of that stuff that's happening right around 17 18 is very hard mixed with like real exploration of the self that happens in acting school um but i also think juilliard it is a very technical school and i i appreciate that when it comes to a lot of the work, especially like the classics and Shakespeare and being able to take scripts apart. Um, because then you're not, I mean, acting really shouldn't be a, a a therapy session. It's just once you take it home or once you perform it, it becomes extremely intimate and personal. And, and I had a heart and I think I separated those things for a while. I just approached it technically for a Mm. while and then felt like, Oh, maybe I'm doing a pretty good job sometimes but i wasn't engaged mm-hmm. in the same i wasn't probably letting other people change me mm-hmm. um and then later in life i i realized that's really where the satisfaction comes is 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 letting go of that control of yes yeah of everything that, every idea you have about it So where were you in your life and career when you met this Joshua Leonard jokester? And, oh. and you know, <laughs> and and <laughs> who, is, who is, by the way, the second actor I ever interviewed on this show? Jo- oh. Joshua Leonard, yes. We met on the festival circuit because he was going around with hump day and I was going around with teeth. And then we just kept showing up at the same festivals. Um and it was like we should make a movie together um yeah you're great i mean he's he's a really smart dude <laughs> and i was like but sure how how do we want to do this and he said he had found a short story uh um and based on the lies premise of a guy that lies and says his baby dies in order to get out of work and <laughs> like how to build a story around that and we we sat down together on that one, like on this one, although we wrote more thoroughly together on this one. But on that one, we also sat down and 
figured out how the whole arc of the movie would need to be mapped out for there to be a journey mm. between this couple. Um, cause I would say both movies are a love story mm-hmm. more than anything else. And they're both improv where we set up what needs to happen in every scene. Um, and then go for it a few times with two cameras on us. So you can sort of, cr- you're cross covering and you can use right. the little bits that never get repeated um, because there's something to match it to on the other side. Yeah. And so we did the lie like that. And what it, I think, I feel like, you know, more than I, maybe 2011 is yeah. when it came out. Yeah. yeah. Sundance 2011 yeah. was the lie. 10 years um, ago. 10 years ago and 10 years later, here we are making like a prequel. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's the right. couple had the baby in 2011 and got pregnant in 2021. Right. Yeah. When he was on, he was talking about in a way, the first draft kind of is the improv that you guys would do. And then the second draft is the editing. It's like an interesting way of, of, of looking at it. Like in other words, when it's not written, meaning like this is the, the, um, the writing of this is kind of like written in the performance as a, and that's the first draft. And then the second draft is the, is the editing kind of, so what was, was a fascinating. I would actually say it's three drafts because we do write out the scenes with a few uh, lines in there, knowing kind of what we need to get through. Mm-hmm. We like imagine the scenes, mm-hmm. but as if you're reading a short story. Mm-hmm. And then and then we act it and we figure out, oh, this is kind of what comes out mm-hmm. of us when we do it this way. And then we do a few variations on the theme of how that goes. Yeah. And then the editing. Whenever I hear of a comedy improv movie, I always think this is a huge mountain to climb for me as a snotty audience member. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's like this. I, do, I, I feel the same way, actually, even though I work this way. The, the thing that happens in the bad ones, and I think it's why they got the name Mumblecore. <laughs> yes. Is, is like people are just like, talking about stuff like shooting the shit everybody's yeah. trying to say something kind of clever yeah but act really naturalistic and oftentimes in the attempt to be natural you lose the problems you make yes. yourself so comfortable in the attempt to be natural that you don't have any task at hand anymore you're not activated right. anymore you're not trying anymore and the thing that's interesting to watch are people like trying yes very hard yes. <laughs> like, yes you just want to fight for people um which i think is why with comedy gen with with improv comedy i think it's a little different than like improv drama yes. and we tried to marry the two worlds or there's enough grounded drama in there that you really believe these people but it is extended to the degree that the stakes stay high for us yes so it doesn't get like real casual and then you're just like i could also sit in a coffee house and watch this right right (laughs) i could watch this on my tv or in a coffee house and nobody wants to watch that movie (laughs) or i don't you and i don't want to watch right no (laughs) but but it's it's also funny how how real i need the situations to be for me to laugh it's 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 really interesting how real even 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 with even with ridiculous almost absurd things like like the bedroom scene Uh like it still needs to be happening in reality for me to really laugh in the way I laughed. And, and I feel like you guys knew that. And, 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 and a lot of, you know, a lot of times you see movies where they, they kind of get there without bowing to that master of reality, Mm. you know? And I think Joshua called it the, uh, this is a fascinating thing that I can't really fully understand the phantom limb of naturalism. Oh my God. What does that mean? He said that (laughs) (laughs) the phantom (laughs) limb of, I'm going to get him for this. (laughs) But I think I know what he means. Like when you keep doing something over and over again and you pull 
out things like I'm like I'm like I've heard you guys talk about like the end scene with the parents like hours of an hour long take or something like that and then you spend months Mm -hmm. just editing that and then you pull out these things and create this (laughs) phantom limb meaning because it's not real it wasn't really there or, or it's not really there anymore but you create it like like if you cut out off your arm but you still feel like it's there this is what I'm hmm. assuming he means. <laughs> I'm trying so hard. I think you're on the right track. It's funny because with some scenes, it really feels like it's a phantom limb. Like you don't know, you know, there needs to be like an arm put on this body in order to make it complete. But you're, but you're like, what? I think it's there somewhere. Right. But, but that's interesting because you almost don't need it to be a real arm. In other words, like I can just. I could laugh because all I need is the phantom limb like, or, or to have this almost thing happen, like the suspension of disbelief. It's almost like the Mm -hmm. suspension of naturalism. (laughs) We're getting into the weeds here, but, but, but what you just said was brilliant because it's like, you don't really need, it's almost, it's, it's fascinating how little I actually do need to be fooled into thinking, oh, that's a real moment, and I can laugh. That's what I'm trying to say. And I feel like you guys hit this in scene after scene in a subtle way, where sometimes if it, if it was a little more heavy-handed, I wouldn't laugh. It's weird. Well, that's great. I, think, I feel like, I do feel like it all came, like the seeds of everything came from a real place. I mean, I was in the middle of, being pregnant for the first time. Josh had just had a kid. We had talked like in very real ways about, oh my God, like suddenly you're just going to pass on your own childhood traumas and habits to the next generation because it's just all living inside you and they're just going to watch you and do versions of what you do as they learn how to be people. And that's, terrifying and so the the thought of like okay we've done all the thinking of this that we all the therapy on this that we can now we need to like smack each other out of it like what's like one last final attempt to really like shake the other person (laughs) out of their bad behavior yeah um and their bad habits so and all of those things are, are were real fears you know so like issues with power and yeah. codependence and yeah. aggression and you know all of those things that it's like okay what could be actionable and like a face your fears activity to right. do as a couple <laughs> <laughs> and trying to find ones like pegging which yeah. are safe enough just between the two of us, very bonding. And explores a lot of different things. Ex- yeah, it's definitely going <laughs> to dig up some issues. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the, you know, the one I relate to the most is, is wanting to be punched and, and wanting to punch because knowing that I can relate to it also makes me feel like I'm absurd and makes me feel like I need some therapy <laughs> <laughs> myself. <laughs> And so when you're <laughs> laughing at stuff like this and it's touching weird things, it's like, this is amazing. I mean, like, I, I really have to hand it to you guys for getting at this stuff like this and doing this with humor. Thank you. I mean, I also love, though, that in that scene, the other guy is like, Fight Club. Are <laughs> you, you have, fight clubbing? You have to say that. You have to say it's that. It's like, oh, I knew it sounded familiar. It is. It is. They needed it in Fight Club, too. No, oh, it's a common human urge. So, <laughs> but, but how ridiculous was this for you to do this when you were this pregnant? I mean, when he came to you with this idea and, and it, it, it was it just like, yeah, a guy just saying, we get to have a real belly. You know, we don't have to have <laughs> the prosthetic, like, let's do it during this time. I mean, it was crazy. And I think Josh was coming from a place of, having been traveling with his family and really like full-time fathering for a little while 
um, while his wife was on a shoot. And he was like, I just want to make a movie the way that I had the most fun working before in my life. Mm. And that was when we did the lie mm. and working like that. Let's do it again. Yeah. How cool would it be if we did it again when you're actually this pregnant? Like, what can we come up with? And then we, and at first I was like, haha, I don't need to make a movie right now. <laughs> um, but because my doctor was like, don't be too stressed out. My white blood cell count was apparently as high at six months as it should have been while giving birth. Mm. Like my body was overreacting and overstressing. I was like, I don't know if it's a good idea to like add a crazy improv film shoot on top of it. And then it just seemed, I was like, I just don't see why not. I really, I really want to, I think it would be fun. And I got so much better over the course of mm. making the movie because I, my stress went down mm. because I had an outlet for all of these ridiculous thoughts and feelings. And I was not sitting around one wondering about the mysteries of parenthood. Yeah. yeah. I was just like playing with my friend, getting out in the world, exercising my, our demons yeah. in a, you know, uh, it, it was a, it was the best. And one, there's one point women aren't really like throwing up in the eighth month of pregnancy, which is where I was at while we shot, but it was like late at night and we just done the, the sequence of the fire and all that. And it was yeah. like a little too much smoke. And I was like, Oh God, no, I don't feel good. And so I just like vomited <laughs> and it's like midnight. And then we had like a kissing scene in front of the fountain after that. Cause it was all night shoot stuff. And it was totally fine. Like, it, all I have to say is it's like sometimes you just got to throw up, get it out, and, like, keep, go right. keep going. And I really, I felt so much better that I had something to do and something to focus on that felt like it was for me, mm -hmm. you know, because you're so focused on preparing right. the nest of your home and making plans, and it was, like, a nice selfish thing to just go hang out with my friends and also you know not fully lose the concept of parenthood <laughs> right i mean it's it's it was all worth it just for the shot of you wearing that dildo with your with your pregnant belly yeah i thought to myself my daughter's gonna see this one day <laughs> and i don't know what's gonna happen I don't know. I can't control her reaction to this. And I'm just going to have to tell her, honey, mommy needed to do it. Some things are just for me. Yes, you're in the shot. Yes, you're there. I'm, I guess I brought you there unwillingly. But at that point in time, you were just with me. Right. Right. She doesn't have and rights. I was doing what I had to do. She doesn't have rights yet. I mean, come on. <laughs> I really hope she's not mad because <laughs> I think I, it's great. I had this, the, our set one of our cinematographers, Shaheen, um, he turned to us all shooting and he was like, it made me feel so much better. Cause I, I was like, Oh my God, this is really intense. Actually putting this on. I was like, I'm getting like a heat rash, like wearing a dildo under my pregnant belly. Wow. Like I'm feeling more emotional about this than I thought I would. Oh, yeah. And um, and he was like, "You look like a like an Indian goddess, like yeah. With, yeah, with many arms and all the sexual body parts, and pregnant." And I was like, <laughs> "Yes." Oh, that makes me feel so much better. <laughs> I found an interview eleven years ago when you guys were doing had just done the lie and the interviewer was talking about the way you approach your career at the, at that moment. Like, do you think about the trajectory of your career? And your answer was something like, it's more about you're following your inspiration and you were hoping that that would continue. And 
then you said, but one day I'm going to want to have a baby. Hmm. The implication was that, you know, this kind of following inspiration may have to become more focused, I guess, one day or something like that when you have a baby. So it, it was interesting. Or like more commercial jobs. With having a <laughs> maybe, baby. maybe. <laughs> but it's interesting. 10 years later, here I am talking to you. You just had a baby. Mm -hmm. You're, you've been doing this job successfully for 10 years. But I wanted to just know, has your approach to this changed since you've become a mother? And even before that question, I guess I should ask, those 10 years that came after that interview, were you just following your inspiration and, and working with people that were inspiring you and not so worried about the big picture? And is that, has that changed now that you have a baby and some kind of bigger picture needs to be thought about now because of that? I think my original answer is still the best one. And I actually have to strive towards remembering that because I mean, to, to just like follow your inspiration, follow your passion, listen to what you're attracted to and then fight for what you're attracted to. I haven't come across that many times where I'm being offered like a ton. I haven't come across any time where I'm being offered a ton of money for something bad. So I actually haven't come up against that. I mean, I feel like even the TV work that I've done, which maybe like the Western I did or something maybe wouldn't be called like revolutionary in terms of the kind of filmmaking or avant-garde, but it was a blast. It was still a world that I loved being in and something I loved doing. But as an actor, and I probably every actor relates to this unless they're huge. Um, you also, it has, it's like a two way street. People have to be attracted to you. And so often the jobs where you're like, that job should be mine. You just don't get it. it mm -hmm. Like it goes to somebody else. So it, it always feels to me when I get to do something that I love that it's because there was like a chemistry between us. Like, Oh, I, I think I have some chemistry with this other artist and our alchemy could do something really like fun and good. And we'll discover some stuff together and push each other. I, I, I'm sure if at this point some, large network procedural tried to hire me, it'd be hard to turn it down. And maybe it would also be awesome. I mean, right. I also like a lot of network right. procedurals. Right. So it's, I, I think if you're bringing yourself to whatever it is, some actors that I love have gone on shows where I'm like, why are they doing that show? And then I watch them in the show and I'm like, you know what? They're actually doing great work. Yes inside of this medical drama right which could be considered like you've seen this episode before mm -hmm. but i haven't seen this episode with this person like living through it and to me that's still beautiful to watch for me as long as i always have some of these cool funky indie projects here and there that will like satisfy my itch for really thinking outside the box. Jess Weixler, thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you for doing one of these, one of these remote interviews. Really appreciate it. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of The Gotham, formerly IFP. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.